11, 12. How are you guys doing today? Thank you. That's the energy I needed. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, my name's Hannah. I'm really excited to be here with you guys. Um, I'm on staff here in 1112. Um, if you guys haven't been here, we're in a book, in the book of Romans, obviously. And we're jumping into Romans 5 today. So if you guys have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Romans 5. If you don't have a Bible, we have some on this bookshelf over here for you. If you don't own one and you want to keep one, you can keep it. Those are for you. And if you need something to take notes with, we have um, note sheets and pens and pencils over there too, so you guys are more than welcome to help yourselves to those. But, so today Romans 5, I'm going to be really honest with y'all, the past couple weeks in Romans have been bleak. The teachings in the first five chapters of this book just continuously repeat into us, it's like, you suck, you're a sinner, you can't do anything, and... You suck. That's like really all it says over and over again. But, and of course, we found the gospel in, hidden in those teachings and hidden in those things, but I feel like chapter five is our first glimpse at actual hope. It's our first time that Paul blatantly lays out the gospel, purely sets it out word for word, and tells us what is true. You guys ready? All right. We're going to start in verse one. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Pause. It says, therefore, since we have been justified. Justified, a quick Google search says, declared or made righteous in the sight of God. I have a note in my Bible that says justified is justice satisfied, if that's a helpful way for you to remember it. Um, in the past, right, in these past few chapters, like I said before, we look at Romans 3. It says, no one is righteous, not even one. No one seeks God, no one looks for God, and no one is good, no one does good. We've seen in these, uh, in these passages that we are enemies to God in our natural state because of original sin and because of the Garden of Eden and how sin has flown through each and every single generation until today, we were natural-born enemies of God. But when it says that we have been justified because of Christ's work, that justice, that wrath that we were supposed to receive was put on Christ. And so the justice that needed to be satisfied has been satisfied in the death of Christ. And so when it then follows with, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, that means that that fight, that enmity, that us being enemies and God being perfect and us, be unbe not, us not being able to live up to that, that's been done away with. When Jesus said, it is finished, he means it is finished. The fight is over and we have victory on our side. Verse 2, through him we have also obtained access by faith into grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of glory of God. We have received access into grace by faith. We've been covering this idea of what faith is the past few weeks, and to really boil it down, faith is a vessel, right? Faith is the vessel by which we receive salvation. It's not what gives us to it, gives us it, right? It doesn't save us, but it is the vessel by which we receive salvation. And so if faith is the vessel, it brings with it the outcome of faith is rejoicing, hope, and trust in the Lord. The outcome of vessel is the, the outcome of having the vessel of faith is it brings joy, hope, and trust in his glory. When it says that I can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, this is not a hope like oh, I hope God is glorified in this, or I hope I'm doing this good enough so that there's glory in it and God finds that he's glorified. I'm going to be honest with you. God will always be glorified. No matter what you're doing, no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what you're going through, God will always be glorified. In Philippians, it literally says that God is glorified on earth, in the heavens, and below the earth, meaning even in hell, the Lord is glorified. God will always be glorified. Verse 3, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance or perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character produces hope. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. I understand rejoicing in the good, right? Like I had a good day, I won a championship, I got a good grade, someone complimented me, I have a cute outfit on, you know the good in the day-to-day, -day. 
or I can rejoice in my salvation in Christ, like what we do in, during worship when we sing songs that glorify that I was a sinner and now I'm saved. But what about in my suffering? How am I supposed to rejoice in my suffering? We can rejoice because we've been saved by Christ. Because in that salvation, we're given access to God, access to grace, and access to hope, like it says in verse 2. But that hope that reminds us, because of the faith that we have in Christ, this is not our home. I don't know how often you think about the, the length of your life, but if my life is like this, this long, and eternity is like the entire width of length or whatever of my arms from fingertip to fingertip, this is, my, this is eternity, in the grand scheme of it, my life is literally like this big. And the suffering I'm currently going through is literally like this big. Like the tip of my fingernail. Or like as thin as a fingerprint. Like my suffering is tiny. And so because I have hope in an eternity, on an eternal perspective, in an eternal lens, your suffering is temporary. That's important to know. My suffering is temporary. This isn't going to last forever. This isn't going to last forever. And because this is not my home and my suffering is temporary, I can also look to the fact that if, God, if, if what I'm going through is temporary and God will be glorified in it no matter what, I have hope that I'm going to a place where one day suffering will never exist. I'm going to go to a place where there are no tears, where there is no pain, where there is no sickness. And if my life is this big on the span of eternity, then I am so glad that this length is what I get to experience freedom from shame, freedom from pain, freedom from sickness, freedom from tears. I get to experience more. My suffering is tiny. It's short. And in eternity, I too one day will be glorified. Praise God that I will no longer have this mortal coil, this shell, this humanity trapping me and then locking me on the balance between flesh and spirit. I'll be fully spirit. I won't be Hannah. I'll be some glorified, beautiful image of how God created me. I'm going to be perfect in the way that he wants me to be. So my suffering, my sickness, my pain now is temporary, and that is what I have to look forward to. It says, um, it continues that suffering produces endurance or perseverance. I want to make a note really quick. It's not suffering that produces perseverance. It's God in your suffering that produces endurance. It's not suffering in and of itself. It's not pain itself that causes you to grow, but it's God in your suffering that uses it to build endurance. So endurance in like an athletic realm, right, is like to continue to keep going. I hate running, and I'm not a runner, and I wish I was, but I'm just going to use running as an example anyway. If I'm going to train for a marathon, which I probably never will, but, and I need to run, how many miles is a marathon? 26? 26. 26 miles. That's impossible. I'm never going to be able to do that. 26 miles, right? I have to build an endurance to keep going until I reach that 26th mile. But spiritually speaking, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that endurance in suffering means that the suffering is going to continually get easier, right? Because I don't know if you guys are runners, but I'm pretty sure, at least for me, by the time I reach that 26th mile, I would be in so much pain. I would be so happy that it's over. I don't think that's necessarily what endurance means spiritually, but I think it means that I'm going to stick around long enough to see what God is doing through my suffering. If I'm going to persevere, I'm just going to stick around long enough to see what God is doing with this. To me, Paul's definition of endurance here is not that I would remain stronger or get stronger, because I don't think suffering necessarily always makes us stronger. I think the church likes to focus on that, right? I think we like to say, like, it's okay, like, it'll make you better. I think when we look back on our suffering, we can always be like, oh my gosh, God did so much with this. I feel so much better. I feel stronger, right? We can always look back at it with that perspective, but I don't think that's the purpose. I think endurance in this sense means training my mind to look for God in hard times. Perseverance means to train. If I'm going to train to persevere, I'm going to train my mind to look for God in hard times. Suffering also doesn't always end in blessing. And I'm sorry to say, but a lot of people like to say like, oh, at the end of this dark tunnel, there's going to be a beautiful light and a beautiful sunrise or a gorgeous sunset. And like 
it may be hard now, but it'll always get better. That's not always true. Sometimes we go through like crap and it sucks and it's really p- terrible. And at the end, when we're like, oh, so glad that's over, something else happens. Like for me in my life, I lost my dad about a year and a half ago. My dad passed away because he was an alcoholic. And so he had severe liver disease, didn't tell any of us, we didn't know, until eventually he had eternal ble- internal bleeding to the point where it led to his death. It was very traumatic, it was very painful, and it was very horrible. And I hated losing my dad that way. And then a couple months later, in the midst of my grief, my mom had a stroke. And I was like, no way am I about to lose both my parents in a matter of six months. No way. I was like, I'm too young for this. Like, my parents aren't even old. Sometimes at the end of suffering, it does, there's not always this rainbow at the end. Sometimes, I'm just going to be honest, there's more. So then in that suffering, I don't have to hope for a rainbow, right? I don't have to hope for it to get better. I don't have to hope for a sunset. I can have true, real hope by looking to God in it. By asking myself, where is God moving? Can I trust him with this? Do I surrender my pain? Can I give him my suffering? Where, God, where are you moving? Show me. Reveal yourself to me. A lot of us like to get through something hard, and we go, God, I don't see you in this. This is really bad. This really hurts. So have it. And I think we like to pretend that that's surrender, but in reality, I think we're just giving up. I don't think we're actually giving God our suffering. I think we're just saying, God, this sucks, and I don't see anything good in it, so just do whatever you want with it, I guess, because I can't handle it. But by training ourselves to look for God, we can see the good that he's doing even in the midst of the suffering. And so if that's endurance, that's what's causing me to persevere, then let's look at the next verse. It says, suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character. Like we talked about today with the song Refiner, I think this idea of endurance, looking to God, training myself to see him, produces character, and I would define character as faith with integrity. It's like steel hardening in fire or gold being purified by fire. When it goes through something like hot or painful and there's suffering, there's beauty at the end of it. Or you know that like saying how like, what is it like charcoal or dirt gets like compressed so hard that it becomes a diamond, (laughs) right? Like it's, it's pain. But I don't necessarily think that character is moral. I don't think it means that you'll be a better person. I don't think it means that you'll be good at the end of it, because that's not always true. But this idea of faith with integrity, a quick Google search that (laughs) says that integrity is whole, undivided, unimpaired, and sound. And that sounds like this. I know God is good, even though this is not. Faith with integrity sounds like I know God is good, even though this is not. We're not overwhelmed. We're not victim to our circumstance when our character is built in the trust of God. When I train my mind to look for God and I see him in in my suffering and I look to him in my suffering, even if I don't see him and I just keep looking to him, I can see his hand moving and I can have faith that he'll be there. Faith with integrity also sounds like this. Well, okay, let's, see. let's look at this, actually. Faith, the past couple weeks ago, we looked at it this way. Faith is trusting in God's promises. That's how Arnold defined faith. If you weren't here that week, faith is trusting in God's promises. In John 16, Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble. That's a promise. I can trust in that because I've faced trouble, right? I've been through hard things. But at the second half of that verse, he says, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. That's the promise I want to put my trust in. There are promises all over scripture where Jesus says, I will be with you. And and actually following that, he says that he's going to send a helper, someone better than him, someone better than one man who could be present in one place as Jesus, but the Holy Spirit. So I'm not alone in my suffering. So faith with integrity is trusting in his promises with sound doctrine. Character, then, is learning how to trust in his promises with truth, 
believing the truth, not letting suffering shake lies out of us. Because in suffering, it's really easy to look to like, well, God's not here. I'm hurting, so God's not here. God's not real. Why would a loving God bring evil into my life? Why would a loving God let my dad get, let my dad become an alcoholic? Why would a loving God let my dad die? Why would a loving God let my mom have a stroke? We like to like put these, these lies seep into our minds in suffering that aren't necessarily true. But if we are f- firm on sound doctrine, knowing the promises of God, both in and out of suffering, we can trust in him. So then when it says suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and then it says character, hope. Training myself to see God in it, to look to God, to lean on him, and know that he's in control and that he is with me creates hope. And that hope sounds like this. I'm good. I'm safe. I'm secure. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit who's never going to leave me now and forever. I'm safe now. I have God with me now on earth, but also in eternity. I'll be with God for eternity. Through the work of Jesus Christ, we've been given eternal life. There's this image that um, an author used in this chapter. Um, I was reading a commentary on Romans 5, and he says, he quotes the book of Judges, the story of Samson. And Samson says, out of the, sorry, out of the eater comes meat, and out of the strong comes something sweet. Kind of weird, but it's a really good image for us to see God's victory in the midst of something difficult. Samson's story was he was incredibly strong. God gifted him with like superhuman strength. If you want to read that story, please do. And we also did a sermon on it um, in our Greater Than series. So if you want to watch that, it's on our YouTube. But Samson was super strong. And as he was walking from one town to the next, he was attacked by a lion. And when that lion attacked him, he was literally so strong that he just like ripped it in half. Like (laughs) the lion didn't stand a chance against Samson. He literally slaughtered it. And then as he was walking from that previous town to the next, so he was going back to where he came from, he walked past the carcass of the lion that he had killed, and a swarm of bees had made a hive in it. And he was able to eat honey out of the (laughs) carcass of the lion, which is really gross. But a really good image to see, he says, watch how God brings meat out of the eater, nourishment out of something that tried to kill me, nourishment out of something that normally conquers Nourishment that is out of something that normally attacks, something that kills a lion. And watch him bring sweetness out of the strong, something that tries to take me down, something that is bigger than me, something that is stronger than me. There was sweetness from it. There was blessing from it. There was goodness from it. Watch God bring meat out of the eater and sweetness out of the strong. Your suffering is not about you. If we take our eyes off of ourselves and we look to God, we can see that he is the one that brings good from what is painful. He is the one that brings strength to me when what feels like it is stronger than me is attacking me. Verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Like I said before, we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, right? So God's never going to leave me. But this also means that when I fail to suffer well, or I fail to remember that God is with me, or I fail to look to him in my suffering, the Holy Spirit is still in me, residing in me, pointing me back to God, reminding me of who he is, reminding me of truth. God moves in ways that we don't expect. He redeems on timelines that we would never assume. He moves in ways that we would never see coming. And the Holy Spirit residing in us continuously ministers to us when I fail to minister to myself. We're going to jump to verse 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Actually, let's go back to verse 6. Let's read that whole part. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Thanks, Paul. (laughs) He says, while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for us. So according to God, the right time to die was when I was useless. It's kind of funny. 
thanks. But it's good to remember, at the right time, when I was weak, when I was powerless to my sin, when I was dead in my sin, when I was useless to God, before I ever did anything to glorify him, before I ever did anything good for another person, before I ever followed the law perfectly, before I ever obeyed my parents, when I was a piece of trash, a dumpster fire of a human being, God died for me. Jesus died for me. That's my hope. And then there's more hope even in that, because when I, fa- I, I failed, right? I failed to uphold, uphold the law, and the freedom of the gospel shows me that there's grace in that. There's grace from God in my lack of obedience. But there's even more. Verse 9, Since therefore we have now been justified, there's that word again, by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. There's that second half of my hope. Friends, you don't serve a dead Jesus. You do not follow a dead God. We focus a lot on the death of Christ, but we do not talk enough about his resurrection. You have a God, you have a king, you have a savior who has resurrected from the dead. And with that death and that resurrection, it says, Much more now are we saved by his life. If Jesus didn't resurrect, I wouldn't have eternal life. If Jesus didn't resurrect, we wouldn't have hope for eternity. If Jesus only died for my sin but didn't give me life in it, I would be stuck here on earth with my debt being paid. But what about that second half? Where does that actual hope come from? My hope is in eternity. My hope is in freedom. My hope, there's hope now on earth, absolutely for not having to be perfect. I don't have to uphold the law. There's so much freedom in the gospel, but there's even more in eternity. Do not forget the second half. You do not serve a dead Jesus. He is alive and he is well and he is in you. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead is in the Holy Spirit. It's in you. You guys know that famous verse in Philippians where it says, like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? A lot of people like to bash it. They're like, it's not about your football game. Or it's like, it's not, about all your, it's not about your physical strength. I think at times it can be. I think a lot of people are like, slap it on the wall in a gym so that, at a Christian school so that when you play basketball, you're like, yes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No, it's like, sure, if you need the strength of God to get through your basketball game or your football game or whatever, then yes, absolutely. But what about when times are really hard? When Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, he's talking about the secret to contentment, and the secret to contentment is hope in Jesus Christ. He says, I can do all things. I can worship in the pit of despair. Why? Because Christ is with me. I can worship on the mountaintop experiences. Why? Because Christ is with me. I can do all things through the strength of Christ who's residing in me. I am not alone. I suffer well because Christ is with me. I suffer poorly, but Christ is with me. I'm in pain, Christ is with me. I'm joyful, Christ is with me. You can do all things through Christ who resides in you and through you because he is resurrected from the dead, because the Holy Spirit is sealed in you and he is in you and moving through you. Verse 11, more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received reconciliation. Reconciliation, again, that's that, that's that peace, right? That fight between me and God is over. It's been reconciled. It has been redeemed. Me and Christ are no longer enemies. Me and God are no longer enemies, but Christ has completely redeemed our relationship. Verse 12, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, And so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin was indeed in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. So this is talking about Genesis 3. This is talking about original sin. This is talking about Adam and Eve in the garden, the garden of Eden. And there was no sin until the fall of man in Genesis 3. There was no sin until disobedience and pride was met with action and then sin came into the world through Adam. So when it says death came into the world through one man, it's talking about Adam. Sin came through Adam and then for generations to come. And then it talks about how sin is not counted where there is no law. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Um, We talked about how 
the law brings knowledge of sin. I don't know that something is bad until someone tells me that it's bad. I think as a kid, it's like, oh, I'm going to eat a cookie before dinner. And just because I want a cookie and I want to live my life and I want to have fun and I want it. But when your mom or your dad or your grandma is like, you can't have cookies for dinner. And you're like, well, I didn't know that was bad. I just wanted to enjoy a cookie. I think sin's like that. I think it's like you're doing this thing or you're living this way until the Holy Spirit, you know, like convicts you or someone calls you out or you read scripture and you're like, I didn't know that I was doing that, but I'm, I'm doing it. I don't think we often know what is sin until the law points it out to us. The law also, as Arnold taught us a couple weeks ago, brings us knowledge of who God is. So without the law, there is no sin. And without the law, there is no knowledge of God. So this is how we are able to create a doctrine around this because Paul is showing us that the law does have purpose. Just because it's, we have freedom in Christ doesn't mean the law is completely useless. Uh, verse 15. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, Adam, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ. The free gift, then, is salvation. The free gift is grace. The free gift is not like the trespass. The free gift is not, shack it's not shackles. It's not handcuffs. It's not painful. It's not death. It's freedom. It's life. It's eternal life. It's hope. It's glory. It's grace. And it's freedom. 16. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. Again, there's that justified. I have been, the justice that needed to be satisfied was satisfied in Christ. Though, what I love here is that, that balance because it says, following one, the, one man's failure for judgment following one trespass brought sin and condemnation for all people. But then all of that sin is put on one man. Jesus is the better Adam. Jesus is the second Adam. That's actually a theme we see a lot in scripture. 17, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. 18, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. This is important. By the one man's obedience, many were made righteous. Notice it says Christ's obedience, Christ's perfect life, Christ's following of the law. And then his death and resurrection. The work and the life of Christ is perfect. It is his work that saves us, not mine. Notice it doesn't say, for by the man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by my obedience, I will be made righteous. It doesn't say that. It says by the work of Christ, you will be made righteous. It's not about you. It's never been about you. I, like I said before, our suffering is not about us and our salvation is not about us. I can do nothing. If at the right time that Christ died was when I was useless and weak and powerless to my sin, then why do I think I can do something to earn it? If at the right time, the perfect time was when I was still a sinner, Christ died for me, I have, wow, we have a God who is so compassionate. Because when I was weak, he replaced that weakness with strength. He became my strength. He became my freedom. And he put on sin. Who knew, he who knew no sin put on sin so that I may experience life without it. Verse 20, now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. It doesn't necessarily mean that the law came and then people sinned more. When it says 
the law came in to increase sin, to increase the trespass. It's not that people were sinning more because of the law. It's that their awareness of sin became greater. And I think this is really beautiful for our life as Christians because something that I've recognized in my life, or I've had a lot of conversations with Sam about this, if you guys remember Sam, is that it's not about me getting better as I get older or the longer I'm a Christian, but it's about my awareness of my sin. The more I come to know Christ, the more I come to know the goodness of the Lord, the sweetness of his mercy and the generosity of his grace, the more I come to hate the sin that keeps me from him. So if the law creates an increase of sin, it's not necessarily that I'm sinning more, but I'm so much more aware of it. And where it says here, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Christian, you cannot out the cross. Where sin comes and it keeps coming and you just keep sinning, grace extends farther and farther and farther and deeper and wider and higher than you could ever sin. You could never do something so bad that grace, God's grace couldn't cover it. Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And that's so comforting to know that I will never, I don't have to feel shame because God's grace abounds more than I could ever imagine. Isn't that freeing? Isn't it sweet to know that because of this grace, I can come to him boldly? Earlier, I think it's verse 2, it says that we have access to God. We have access to grace. So then if in this freedom, I can come to God with my sin. I can come to God with my shame. Why? Because I cannot out the grace that God has given me. I can come to God in my suffering. I can come to God in my shame. I can come to God in my sin. I can come to God in all things. Why? Because he can handle it. He loves me. Why am I so afraid of bringing it to him? It says, Christ, it says God loved us so much that while we were still sinners, Christ died. Why do I doubt it? Why do I doubt his love in my suffering? Why do I doubt his love in my sin? That's not to sh- that's not putting, I'm not putting shame on you either. I'm not saying, like, you doubt him. Be better. I'm just saying, like, the evidence is clear. I'm going to put my, I'm going to put faith with integrity, trusting in promises with sound doctrine. God loves me. And in my suffering, I may not see it, but I can know it. That's sound doctrine. And then it says, so that as sin reigned in death, Grace might also reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So through the work of Christ, we receive grace, and we also receive righteousness through the vessel of faith, and the outcome is righteousness and grace in our Lord Jesus Christ, which brings us to eternal life. Friend, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what this year has been like for you. I don't know what this week has been like for you. But I just hope that this is encouraging to you, that you can continue to look to the one who brings meat out of the eater, to look to the one who brings sweetness out of something that's trying to push you down, to pull you away from him. God's victory is greater than anything that we're going through. Like we saying, like, you raise beauty from ashes, that's what you do. You turn sorrow to gladness, that's what you do. Jesus is in the business of making things new. You do not have to worry about your suffering. Yes, it's painful, and I'm not pushing that off because you have a God who is very real and who is very with you in it. And I have tons of passages of Scripture that I could show you later if you need that comfort, if you need to see that. Because I have so many that show you where Scripture promises that God is with you in it. But know that your suffering is temporary. Know that eternity is coming. Know that you have a God who longs to meet with you and longs to see you in your suffering. Will you pray with me? God, thank you so much for this. Thank you for this reminder that your, your son, your work has paid it all. That in my failure or in my suffering or in my sin, I can come to you. Thank you, God, that you have freed me from the shackles of sin and of shame. And thank you, God, that you have freed me from the burden of suffering. Father, would you just move through me and through these students and through our staff this week as we step into what's ahead of us? Would you put this scripture at the forefront of our mind? Would you remind us that you are stronger than what we're going through, that you are victorious enough to bring something good that we would never expect out of our suffering? 
Father, would you move through us? Would you teach us? Would you continue to refine us so that we can put our trust in the, tr- in the promises of your scripture? Would you help us to understand them clearly? Would you help us to find sound truth in them so that we can continue to put our hope in you? Thank you, God, that you sent your son to die for us, and thank you for the freedom and the grace that you give us after that. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen.